Again, a big welcome. It's really nice to be here with everyone. And uh, I appreciate all that we're all doing to manage during the virus. And uh, so one of these ways is teaching with a mask. So if both folks online and the Zoom meeting, the people here in the room, if ever there's a hard time hearing me, just let me know. And people on Zoom, you can either um, put something in the chat or just raise your hand too if you have a question or if you're having trouble um, with the audio. And I especially appreciate these four intro classes we do every year. So generally there's a, a six week introduction to mindfulness meditation or mindful awareness practice. Buddhist awareness practice. We have different ways of talking about it. And the way we teach it here, it really comes out of the early Buddhist tradition or Theravada Buddhism here in the West. Sometimes this early Buddhist tradition is called insight meditation or Vipassana meditation. So common ground is in that lineage. And it's, uh, it's really pretty straightforward. It doesn't mean it's easy. It may, in fact, be the hardest thing you ever do because we're retraining our mind. And I'm sure we all have our own sense that the predominant cultural habit, I won't even say it, just think, what is, if you had to characterize, and it's not just Western culture, I think it goes beyond that, but it's certainly modern human culture. What is one of the most significant attributes of modern human culture? distractedness, you know, and the best minds in our world, what are they doing? What do they get paid to do? Create distractions. And especially these days, the media world, fortunately there's some advantages to the media world, but we can connect. There's about, looks like uh, over 50 people online. And for those of you online, we have about 10 or 12 people in the room. So given how our attention works and given that the smartest people are figuring out how to capture our attention <laughs> and hold it because they make money that way, right? Then we, we realize, oh, I need to really train my mind not to follow not just the external um, triggers or stimuli, but there are a lot of internal triggers, right? So even when we're like, this is what people realize in the middle of the night when you wake up and our mind is haunted, not by the irritating dog bark from the neighbor's house or generally it's our own triggers. We remember something we should have done we remember something that didn't go the way we wanted it to go. And we feel haunted, we spin with that. So our training these six weeks, and, and I'm sure you realize, I hope you realize that this is just the beginning. And there are people in our community that have taken the intro class. I think some people, there are a couple that have taken it, you know, definitely more than five times and maybe closer to 10 times over the years. And that's why I like teaching it too because the practice actually is pretty simple, but it's not easy. So before I say more, let's just do some practice and um, it will get, give everyone, especially there's probably a few people here that haven't done really that much mindful awareness practice. And so it may be somewhat new to you. There is of course, as you probably know, a lot of different kinds of meditation. And this Buddhist awareness practice has a very particular flavor. So just sit comfortably. You don't need to change how you're sitting. Just check and make adjustments if you need to. Eyes can be open or closed, either way is okay. And simply notice what the mind is aware of, what the mind is knowing. It could be anything you might feel uncomfortable or self-conscious, then notice that that's being known, being felt. 
or might be feeling some sensation in the body, might be hearing sound like the sound of my voice, but just explore whatever it is that the mind is aware of, that the mind is sensitive to, can it be left alone? In other words, we're just sitting in a relaxed way and exploring being exposed to whatever it is that the mind is knowing, the heart is sensing. Can we leave it alone? So whatever the exposure is through the five physical senses of sensing, sensation, sensing the visual experience through the eyes and sound through the ears and probably to a lesser degree smelling and tasting. But also then the sixth sense gate is awareness of mental activity. So we know the world these six ways. So can we relax with that sensitivity? Can we leave it alone? So we could call this relaxed and alert or allowing and sensitive at the same time. And we're gonna do a simple body scan for this opening meditation. So as if for the very first time, simply feel the sensations at the top of the head. And it might be something really simple like that subtle feeling of weight, the weight of the hair or if there are any of you that don't have much hair at the top of the head, you might feel the air touching the skin. Or you might feel some pressure, some vibratory sensation there at the top of the head. But just be clear and relaxed as you feel the top of the head. And then include both ears now and any sensations around the ears. For example, is it a cool or a warm feeling in the ears? Back of the head. And then feeling the forehead and the brow, temples. And again, being aware and but just ex experiment, can I leave these sensations be? Just let them be. So if there's some tension in the brow or forehead, it's not about fixing, it's about being clearly aware. It's like this now, can this be okay? Just to feel what's being felt here. And feel the those of us in the room, we're gonna feel the mask against the face. Those of you at home, notice any predominant sensations in the face, including that simple experience of the eyelids touching the eyes. Any tension around the eyes. Feel the air touching the skin of the face wherever there is some exposure. Notice the jaw, the mouth, the lips, the tongue, any sensations here. So in a way we're relearning how to be intimate, which requires both that alertness and relaxation.
a kind of trusting, trusting awareness to know. In this case, to know the sensations in the head and face, just as they are. And then we're just gonna move down through the body. So letting the attention open to the throat and the neck and back of the neck, take your time. Clearly aware, alert and interested, but at the same time, relaxed, allowing these sensations in the neck to be the way they are. I'm not trying to fix, just being intimate with the neck as if for the first time. And then down to the tops of the shoulders. Notice if there's any tension here and don't ignore the simple sensations like the shirt you're wearing making contact with the skin there at the top of the shoulders. So we're not just interested in <coughs> stiffness or if you have some pain in your shoulder, but also the neutral sensations, the ordinary sensations here. And let the attention move down through both arms so we feel the biceps, underarms, the sleeves of our shirt touching the skin along the arms, the bend of the elbows. Feel the hands touching whatever they're touching, any point of contact, back of the hands. and the simple sensations in the fingers. Just how good it is, how peaceful it is to bring some wholehearted attention into the arms and hands. This simple, wholesome desire to be close or to be aware of how it is in the hands and arms, shoulders and throat and neck and head and face. And we'll begin to include the whole torso now. So you might wanna go down starting up by the collarbones, upper back and upper chest. And again, we're just feeling aware of whatever's here to feel. not afraid to feel the sensations that are here in the upper part of the torso. And we begin to sense and feel the structure of the rib cage. And of course, the ordinary movement here due to the breathing process. And maybe for some of you even feeling the more subtle movement of the heart deep in the chest, this pumping heart and the sternum and the clothes you're wearing, making contact with the skin and the upper half of the torso, the solar plexus and the kidneys and the space between the shoulder blades. Just again, the simple desire to be close. Down into the abdomen and the lower back. Feeling what's here to feel. And feeling the structure of the pelvis groin, the sits bones, hip sockets. And 
And then again, for a few moments, feel the entire upper half of the body. Just remembering these two sort of supporting skills to be alert and relaxed, interested and trusting. And of course, we'll feel both legs when you're ready. Just simply aware of any touch points or pressure points as you feel where the legs are making contact, the bend of the knees. Feeling both feet, the toes, the heels. And aware of the whole body, just as it is. One of the key aspects of mindful awareness is this not, no need to judge. Because we simply open to the experience of the sitting body. We don't need to visualize the body. We don't need to have a story about the body. Now, the thinking mind might do those things. That's okay. But learn how to be intimate with the actual sensations of the body now. The totality of the sitting body, the breathing body. And it is a little like a powerful exposure to all these sensations, these changing, moving sensations of the body. And of course, some will be unpleasant. And a lot of the sensations are probably in the neutral range, neither pleasant nor unpleasant. But whatever the sensations are, just explore if you can be completely open and exposed and allowing, not needing the body to be different right now. Kind of unconditional surrender to the sensations that are moving here in the body. And interestingly, just explore, is it really possible to stop being aware? Awareness is an interesting phenomena. We don't really do it. We recognize awareness, but we don't really turn it on and off. It's like you don't have to make a particular or personal effort to hear my voice. Hearing is just happening, isn't it? Knowing, the knowing of the sound or the knowing of the visual experience or the knowing of the sensations in the body just happens naturally when the mind is undistracted. So now if the eyes have been closed, you can slowly open them. And you can stretch the body a little if you need to, whatever feels good for you, stretch.
So that's just a little taste for those of you who are new to mindful awareness practice. It's not really the same awareness, mindfulness, isn't really the same. It's close, but it's not really the same as consciousness. It's like some of you, you know, drove today from work back home, or some of you who came to the city center here in Minneapolis, you drove here. And presumably you were conscious while you drove, but that doesn't mean you were aware while you were driving. In each moment, was there an awareness that it's like this now? So when we use, you know, an awareness, the word we're talking about here is sati. It's a Pali word, which is one of the ancient languages in India related to Sanskrit, you know, which is a little bit more well known. But the uh, early Buddhist teachings, the talks of the Buddha were recorded in the Pali language. And since, of course, have gotten translated, you know, in the early centuries to Chinese and then to Tibetan and to Sanskrit, as I mentioned. But in our tradition, you know, we refer to the Pali uh, rendition of the Buddhist teachings. And this word sati, which we generally translate as mindfulness or mindful awareness, but more lately, more scholars are using just the word awareness. But it's not the same as consciousness because we're really talking and you can just use your own mind right now. It's like, oh yeah, the consciousness that can know seeing or hearing or touching or no thinking, but it's a different kind of mental muscle to know when I'm seeing that seeing is being known. It's a kind of reflective knowing. So like I could, you know, do any road activity, something that I do all the time, and I'm conscious while I'm doing it, but I'm not aware that this is happening, this is being known when it's happening. And that's the mental muscle we're really going to be developing during these six weeks, this reflective knowing that we call mindful awareness or awareness. So what's the mind knowing now? And if you feel a little bit on the spot, that's fine because awareness will know, oh, there's a little self-consciousness because Mark just asked the question. Maybe he's going to call on me, right? So, oh, self-consciousness is being known. That's that reflective knowing. So when we say, um, you know, when a teacher or whatever, you ask yourself, am I being mindful? It means, am I aware of what the mind is knowing? The mind is going to be knowing unless you're deep asleep or, you know, been put out by a doctor. There's consciousness. The mind is sensitive to these six things. The mind is sensitive to mental activity. So in Buddhism, that's the sixth sense. Right, because we know the world only in these six ways hearing, smelling, tasting, touching, seeing, and awareness of or consciousness of mental activity. And emotions are sort of a blend between sensation and mental activity, right? So that's a, the only way we know experience. And mindful awareness means when the mind is sensitive to one of these or a combination of these six things that it knows that this is being known. It's like a mirror reflecting back, oh, this is being known. So when we did the body scan earlier, you know, at the beginning, what we want to see, and you can just try it now, let's like touch something with your hand, whatever, you don't have to move, your hand's probably already touching something. But if not, like I have my hand on my thigh. And you know, there's all kinds of sensation, right? The warmth, pressure, my pants feel smooth, so there's smoothness. And so there's the touching and we can be aware that touching is being known. Touching is being known. Touching is like this. 
And that awareness, that mindful awareness only happens in the present moment. There's no other place for it to happen. Now, the amazing thing is if we develop an understanding of what mindful awareness is and we learn how to sustain it, not just when we're formally sitting in meditation for 30 minutes, because then the rest of the day, you know, the other 18 hours or whatever it is, we're totally lost in thought, distracted, caught up in some reactive pattern. That 30 minutes where we tend to be more mindful doesn't really stack up against the 18 hours of being in reactive patterns or distracted. So the point of the formal sitting time, it's really important, you know, especially for a course like this, to do your best to put a little time in every day. Even if it's just five or 10 minutes, it's a lot better than no minutes. And then if you can do 30 minutes every day, that would be great. And then if you're doing that formal sit where you've found some place in your home where you got the cat or the dog in the other part of the home and the people you live with know to leave you alone and you've shut your cell phone all the way down or maybe you don't even have it around you so it's not you're not tempted to pick it up and get a timer so you don't have to look at a clock decide ahead of time how much time do i have where i really know i have that much time so you won't like doubt your choice in the middle of your set, right? You set it, have a nice peaceful sounding timer. There's actually a free app called Insight Timer, or maybe it's Insight Meditation Timer. I think it's just Insight Timer um, that has just a nice sound and you can just set the amount of time. And there's probably many of those. Most of them you know, have other features you can pay for, but you should be able to get more than a couple um, that just is a free timer or just get a nice use your own timer on your phone that has a quiet uh, bell at the end or quiet sound at the end. And then you're sitting there and we're just, and I'll give you some formal techniques to work with. But like when we did the body scan, it's like we're moving the awareness through the body. It doesn't really matter how you do it, but in some kind of systematic way, each time you put your attention in a particular place, right? You, the mind that knows, knows those sensations. And then as you relax, you'll see that space of mindful awareness where the mind knows that the head is being known, knows that the sensations in the neck are being felt, knows that the shoulders are being felt, knows that the sitting body is like this. And that mindfulness has a particular flavor that you'll get familiar with. It feels stable. It feels inclusive. It's really hard to be mindfully aware and mean, right? Because there's, there's an inclusive aspect to being mindfully aware. Oh, this is how it is now. And there's definitely a place you can mimic me, um, the kind of phrases you hear me using, not in a neurotic way, you know, like self-talk, but just at times like the phrase, oh, this is how it is now, or this is being known. Like you can drop, use that phrase to help wisdom recognize, oh, there is this reflective knowing what the mind is knowing. The mind is knowing, is aware of what the mind is sensitive to, whether it's physical sensations or thought. Oh, planning mind is being known, right? The mind can know that. Oh, planning mind. Oh, worrying is being known. You see somebody walk in the room and you really like the sweater they're wearing. Oh, wanting is being known or somebody else is pushing your buttons, oh, irritation is being known. So the idea is in the, the formal set, let's just say 30 minutes a day, 
you're building your skills, you're building your momentum. Of course, the distractions and engagements of the day, you're going to get, you're going to be lost in the, in the push and pull of the day, but hopefully more and more you'll come back and you'll just naturally have a few moments where you're doing what you're doing, you're driving, and then there will be an awareness. Oh, driving is like this. Driving is like this. And you might notice then once you connect generally with this, oh, being tight is like this. You know, you realize your shoulders are near your ears. Oh, no, it's not about I'm doing that in order to release the physical tension, but all of that dropping of what's not useful happens naturally when we're aware. As I mentioned, it's not easy to be mean when you're mindfully present. But basically, unhelpful, unskillful habits grounded in greed, hatred, and delusion. That's how we talk about it in Buddhism. You know, the active manifestation of ignorance is greed and hatred mostly. And they arise out of the heart, the mind, not seeing clearly. Because when we're greedy and hateful, and hate includes all the different flavors of aversion. So fear too would be under that category of hate. They make the body and mind tight and often make those around us tight, right? They cause suffering or stress. They cause others suffering and stress. And when we're mindfully aware, we see that. It's like, and change can happen. Just like when we're relating in a generous way, in a kind way, in a gentle way, in a, an appreciative way, we realize how the kind, kinds of seeds that get planted in our mind stream, in our heart, they're useful, aren't they? <laughs> you know, things, it's like we're harmonizing in a way where things work better. So it's not like I'm trying to be kind or I'm trying not to be impatient. It's more, my, this practice is more about being aware. So when I am being impatient, what does awareness reveal? Honey, this doesn't work very well. You know, you're planting seeds for stress. It's stressful and you're planting seeds for more stress down the road. And so the abandoning of the unwholesome habits happens organically, naturally. It isn't egoic, me trying to be a good person. From the point of view of me, the practitioner, there is initially, you know, a sense of self who got yourself here tonight, right? Or those showed up on Zoom tonight. So there is this sense of involvement, this sense of self that is involved in the practice. But our, it isn't about uh, sort of a normal self-improvement idea, like here I am and I want to become a more perfect me. Because that idea itself is stressful. I don't like where I, who I am, what I am. I aspire to be this. It's more like I've tried getting better <laughs> and it doesn't, hasn't worked very well. So now I'm putting my money in just being intimate with the way it is, being mindfully aware, being present. And I trust people like the Buddha and others who have done this with some sincerity that good stuff starts to happen when we're present. The personality is transformed who we are, how we live, how we act, but not through some act of will. It's a real organic purification of the mind, the heart, just by learning to value and strengthen that capacity. It's a natural capacity to be aware, but it's mostly unused. So initially it might it's not that uncommon that people feel a little bit self-conscious being uh, mindful because we're not familiar with that reflective knowing. 
it's almost like, should I actually be receptively aware of what I'm thinking when I'm thinking it, what I'm doing when I'm doing it? It's like we, it's, I mean, it's so weird to say it, but it's almost like we prefer anonymity even with ourselves. <laughs> I mean, it's crazy, but that's sort of like, I'd rather be an autopilot. I really don't want to know what I'm thinking when I'm thinking it or what I'm doing when I'm doing it. And the, the whole thrust of the practice is there is so much value in being present all the time. And it isn't about like, oh, I because I really want to see how good I am, or I really want to see how bad I am, because it, it really isn't about judgment. And this is why that mirror, it's not a perfect simile for our practice, but it's a, it's a useful one, because when we have a mirror, it's just going to reflect what's going on in front of the mirror. And the mirror doesn't care if someone's doing something despicable in front of it, it's just gonna reflect it back. Or somebody could be doing something really beautiful in front of a mirror, but the mirror is just gonna reflect it back. And that's a nice image for this, the nature, the sort of characteristic of mindful awareness. It's just reflecting back to the mind itself. It's the mind, an aspect of the mind, reflecting back to the knowing mind and wisdom Oh, it's like this. This is being known. This is being known. And one of the techniques that's used, has been used in early Buddhism, is uh, sometimes called a mental noting technique. And it's useful to experiment with it. You don't, again, have to use it obsessively, but just like it's a kind of a training instrument, both when you're sitting, but also during the day, silently in your own mind. Just drop in a quiet, relaxed mental note about what the mind is knowing. So like if you're walking and in those moments, you know, what was really predominant, what the attention was tuning into was the crunch of the snow, just that sound. Oh, hearing is being known. And if there was like a wave of nostalgia, like remembering a kid and that sound the snow makes, then you'd note that, oh, remembering, remembering is being known. And then you see dog poop, oh, disgust is being known. And that reminds you of, why didn't I ever get a dog? Oh, thinking is being known. Maybe I'll get a dog, planning is being known. So it's this very neutral, non-judgmental, whether you use the technique of mental noting, you know, where you're naming or labeling what the mind is knowing, whether, and it's always going to be knowing one of these six things, right? It's either knowing some aspect of mental activity, thoughts, or it's knowing hearing, smelling, tasting, touching, or seeing, right? What else could knowing know? But whether you mentally note it or you're just noticing, what the mind is knowing. The idea is to make that the new habit. And the thing is, even though it might feel a little awkward at first, it doesn't get in the way of living your life or doing whatever you do, whether you're raising kids or uh, an executive or a doctor or running a marathon or cleaning the kitchen sink. Mindful awareness is really goes right to the core of helping us be more competent at whatever we're doing, because it's this inclusive awareness. There's that sense. Oh yeah, this is what's happening in the moment. It's a way of really engaging and participating. So I'll leave it here, take a few questions maybe if there are any, and then we'll do, we'll stretch a little, and then we'll do a mindfulness of breathing practice, which is a pretty, common classic Buddhist meditation technique. Yeah. Well, first I just want to commend you because it's great that you notice that two of the sense gates were active, right? There is the mind visualizing. It's a kind of seeing, right? 
It's just not happening with your eyes, but the mind can create, just like we can think with words, we can think with mental images. And this is quite common. You'll notice, some of you will notice this with mindfulness of breathing, that the mind is sort of, the, the sort of production studio of the mind has created a video of breathing. We're not actually with the experience. And in Buddhism, we call that the nama function. The mind is basically conceptualizing. It abstracts the world of the five senses as mental image and mental thought, right? That's just what the mind does, like you suggested. But it's, it's useful because thought and mental images are so seductive meaning we can be in our mind in the world of thought and mental image and think we're in the world. That that's why a lot of the techniques we'll use during this class and just generally is uh, more emphasis on the five senses. So the sensations of the breath. And like you suggested, don't worry if your mind is visualizing the breathing, just give your interest to the physical experience of the breath or the physical experience of the part of the body that you were paying attention to. And remember, sometimes you're not feeling any obvious sensations if you're doing a body scan or you're feeling the breath and the breath is pretty subtle, but you can be aware of that absence too. A lot of what we're gonna be doing um, over the years of practice is realizing that it's okay to be aware of what's subtle because this is another bad habit we've all gotten into is if the experience isn't gross or obvious, it isn't worth paying attention to. But actually in terms of what's really important in the whole realm of spiritual development, subtle is much more significant than the gross. But you know, just through evolution as a creature, we're interested in external and gross and subtle and internal, not so interested in, right? One of the things I often say in one of the first few weeks of the intro class is one of the truly amazing things is all lifelong is we've had a mind and how amazingly uninterested we've been in our mind. You know, we think about other people's minds but to sort of use the capacity to be aware and to get curious, interested in our own mind, like our own subjective experience. It's like we haven't really been given permission, have we? And yet it is clearly, you know, if we thought about it for even a few seconds, the mind is clearly the most relevant thing about being a human being. So why aren't we interested in it? And I'm not saying people study psychology, but they're studying it not subjectively. Like the, what's relevant about the mind is that the subjective experience of the mind, because that's our reality. We're living through our mind. In fact, I mean, this is a little trippy to say it this way, but you know, wherever you are, whether you're looking at a computer screen or you're here in the room, all of this experience of seeing and hearing and thinking and touching, where is it happening? You know, some of you are going to say Minneapolis or Boston or, you know, depending on where you're coming from, but you know, it's happening in the mind. We're having an experience of the mind. Where does seeing happen? You know, well, here in the eyes. No, seeing is happening in what we call the mind. That's where smell happens, that's where touch happens. Like I put my hand on my thigh, I think, oh, I'm feeling my thigh. But the visual experience and the experience of touch is all being known in the mind. And the idea of location is a thought in the mind. No, no, this isn't my thigh. But that's a thought where? In my mind. See, we haven't really, we haven't really gotten interested in what it is to be human. We think we know, we think it's so obvious we don't even have to look. And what mindful awareness this whole path will do, it's really gonna open up 
our experience as a human being. We'll, we'll be like children realizing, I don't have a clue. And that will raise the energy and the interest which you need. Because it's the, the, um, the energy of the interest keeps us going. Because it's hard work. The habit of distractedness, chasing our likes, running away from our dislikes. This is the, this is the toughest addiction for us human beings. How many of us have scrolled endlessly looking for something that's interesting to pay attention to? You know, kind of feed, feed the fix, get another fix of something interesting in the news, video, TV, whatever it might be. Yeah, it's, it's a very specific and easy to understand definition of what's skillful and unskillful. What's skillful is ways of relating that release the constriction, the tightness, the grasping, the holding. And what's unskillful are ways of relating, ways of understanding that plants that are stressful and plant seeds for more stress. So it's, so it's not, um, and so we might have a sense looking at a friend, let's say, that the, what they're doing or how they're relating is unskillful, but actually we'll only have a sense, only that person themselves, if they're interested in observing their heart and mind will know whether the way I'm relating, the way I'm showing up is skillful or unskillful. And it really goes down to what the, the aspect of the motivation or the intention in that moment. When I'm saying something to you now, Nancy, like is my motivation to sort of prove that I'm better than you? Then if I was really mindfully aware, I'd notice the contraction of needing to be better than you. And I would realize, oh, this is unskillful. But if my motivation is really more generosity and appreciating your question and your curiosity and happy that you're interested, then the felt experience of my response will be, will have that flavor of release, not contraction. And this is, I'm glad you brought that up because it's, uh, this is a good thing to mention this first week this is the whole point of cultivating mindful awareness is it allows wisdom to know more clearly what's skillful and unskillful. In fact, that's exactly one of the very simple, but very powerful teachings the Buddha gave. He was teaching some people back, you know, 2,500 years ago. And he was giving them the example of what he did when he was still a practitioner before he had some deep insight. He said, it occurred to me, this is sort of a rough paraphrase. It occurred to me, maybe I should, in observing my mind, maybe I should simply categorize like when thoughts or when ways of relating are unskillful, that it's unskillful. When it's skillful, that it's skillful. And then he found that as I'm living, doing my day, <laughs> living my day, and I just keep noticing how I'm relating and whether it's skillful or unskillful, whether it's planting seeds for release or planting seeds for more tension, I notice that the unskillful habits diminished and the skillful habits increased. So being aware of whether the mind is relating skillfully or unskillfully, relating in ways that increase stress or increase release, is really how we use mindfulness. It's not the same as judgment. It's just, so when I, some unhelpful habit has been triggered, I wanna know, oh yeah, I'm really defensive right now. Good, let's stand for a moment, just to stretch our legs, feel free. And even as we're doing that, just with what you heard tonight about mindful awareness, just be, aware of what your mind is knowing. Again, it might be self-consciousness, it might be a good feeling as you stretch and release or whatever. Thinking about what you're gonna eat when you go home. Oh, that's planning.
And when you feel like you've moved your body enough, we'll sit down. We'll do about 20 minutes of mindfulness of breathing practice. And I'll introduce the instructions as we sit. Next week, week two, I'll talk more about um, ways to sit that might be supportive of your practice. But tonight, just sit any way that feels stable and relatively comfortable. And basically, we're supporting both alertness and relaxation in how we sit. So what does that look for you tonight? Sitting in a way that supports being alert and relaxed. And let's take a couple of minutes at the beginning of the sitting time to be aware of hearing. Notice that you don't really need to make a big effort to hear. Hearing is happening. So now there's a knowing that hearing is happening. Hearing is being known. And just do your best to keep this awareness of hearing in mind. So we're rediscovering this receptive awareness. And remember you can, if it's helpful, you don't have to, but if it's helpful, you can even say in your mind, hearing is being known. And let's bring that same receptive awareness to the sensations of the whole body, the totality of the body sitting. Sensations are being felt. Sitting is like this now. Can this be okay just to, it's almost like a river of sensations flowing on and on. Being both relaxed and alert to this river of sensation from the body. And right here in this experience of sensation, we'll feel the ordinary movement of breathing in, the ordinary sensations of breathing out. And we don't have to control or manage the breathing process because we know the body knows how to breathe on its own. So even if the breath feels er erratic or whatever, that's okay. Just let the body breathe. But be aware of breathing in from the beginning until the end. Be aware of the sensations of breathing out from the beginning until the end. Relaxed and alert. Not forgetting. And we're simply keeping the sensations of the breath in mind.
And let this be the only thing that's important now to be aware of the first moments of breathing in and then simply tracking, being aware of that physicality of breathing in until the very end of the inhalation. And then of course, there's a little gap and then the out breath begins. And just do this one half breath at a time. And if the mind gets distracted, no need to be frustrated. Just begin again in that relaxed or gentle way. Tracking, keeping the breath in mind. And really learn to appreciate the simplicity and the seclusion, right? The mind becomes more and more secluded from what it usually is thinking about or worrying about. Because it's just knowing this one thing, breathing in and breathing out. And when you notice that this continuity of awareness with the breath gets interrupted, then it's really useful to acknowledge the distraction. And this is where you might experiment with a little simple mental note. Oh, worrying is happening. Worrying is being known. Notice how the distraction tends to fall away when it's acknowledged in a non-judging way. Then you can go back, just feel, catch the next breath coming in or going out, connecting and sustaining this relaxed, alert attention. So don't worry about the distractions. Just see if you can catch some of them as something being known. Same with restlessness or sleepiness or whatever it is that arises in a strong way in your experience. Just acknowledge it as something being felt or something being known.
And remember, if you find it hard to connect and sustain with the ordinary breathing process, then just take a moment to get interested in what might be in the way. What is the mind knowing? There might be some reaction. And then be aware, okay, reactivity, it feels like this, it looks like this. This mood is being known or being felt here and now. It's just this reactivity. So let's continue in silence on our own for about 10 minutes. So remember, it isn't a breath control practice. It's an awareness practice. So let the breath just be ordinary. Let the body breathe. 
So we're keeping the breath in mind from the beginning of the inhalation to the end and keeping the breath in mind from the beginning of the out breath to the end. And then when a strong distraction arises, then we're acknowledging this is being known. Acknowledge the distraction as something being known in the present moment or something being felt. No need to be frustrated. No need to be frustrated because of distraction. It's just the next thing being known. Remind both the body and the mind that it's okay to relax. The practice doesn't require tension. With physical pain, 
You can at times just stay with the primary meditation object and let the pain happen in the background. But sometimes the pain will be so strong that the attention's gonna go there no matter what. Then notice if there's aversion, the not liking of the physical pain or physical, physical discomfort. Notice that it's not helpful. And being aware of the irritation or being aware of the aversion is a way of softening the reactivity. Oh, aversion's like this. Not liking is like this. Can I relax with the not liking? See it, feel it for what it is. And you'll get a little space. So just sit for another minute or two, doing the best you can, alert and relaxed. And again, take a little time, stretch if you need to, release any tension in the body. That was a little bit more than 20 minutes, just to give you a sense for those who are new. It's a nice, if you're brand new, that's a nice amount of time to begin with. If you've been practicing on and off some, you might, if you have the time in your life, aim more towards 30 minutes. But five minutes is better than no minutes. So if it's nighttime and you have your pajamas on and you haven't meditated, go to your place. And it's, if you have space in your apartment, in your home, you might have a chair or cushion that if you have that space, that's just used for your meditation practice, some corner, preferably an uncluttered corner of a room can have an altar if you like, or just in front of a nice window or buy some plants or whatever makes sense in your uh, living situation. And then when you see that place that you've made just right for yourself, it will serve as a reminder, you know, every time you pass that area, oh yeah, I am interested in cultivating this habit of mindful awareness. And that cushion or that chair is kind of a outer symbol of my interest. There's a coherence to every aspect of the mind and every aspect of the world, really. There's an intelligence. It's not personal, but it's real. And the mind has its habits. It has its tendencies, right? Have you noticed? And, uh, and just as Ed said, it isn't personal. It isn't actually me that tendency. And, and we shouldn't even think of our mind as one thing, like one condition habit. It's like a committee or different patterns. Each pattern, like I have a defensive pattern and I have a kindly pattern and I, we have these different sort of 
subroutines that can get triggered, right? An envious pattern or a jealous pattern or whatever it might be, a rageful pattern. And it's really useful, like Ed described, to see it as nature, not self. Oh, defensiveness feels like this, looks like this. This is nature, not self. This is the way that it is, or sometimes we'll say it's causes and conditions. So that pattern for me, like as an aspect of my personality to get defensive, it's like a very recognizable pattern. I'm sure you have your own version, you know, or your own recognizable patterns that get triggered for you. And it's really good to see it without judgment, to really give it permission to bloom. I mean, we're not, you know, hopefully not going to, this is the nice thing about the form of city meditation. We're not saying anything or doing anything. It, we're letting, so it's not repression because we're letting it express itself in the space of the heart and mind, right? But we're not actually saying those things to that person. We're just noticing that this is the impulse, the tendency of the mind. We want to burn it down, <laughs> you know? We want that person to get their just desserts or something like that. Because when we let it move, then wisdom can see it for what it is. Like Ed said, it's nature, it's not self. And to whatever degree the mind identifies or personalizes it, we're gonna plant negative seeds, seeds that are stressful, right? And this is the thing, we don't, we're responsible, the, in terms of causing ourselves and others harm, the problem comes when we get identified with the unwholesome habits. Seeing unwholesome, unwholesome patterns is skillful. Identifying with unwholesome patterns is a cause for suffering, right? But we have so many tendencies to be unskillful. We, we want to be appreciative when we see them. We want to see them. The danger is, is when we have unwholesome patterns and we don't see them because then we just are going to get swept away. Noticed a lot about the reality in the mind, in the body, and how the mind was relating and how that matters. And that's the whole point. It isn't about not having that pattern. Like that's a powerful insight to realize that whatever the mind is paying attention to, it has the nature to want to control. And that, to not see that means that every time you get in a relationship, the tendency will be to want to control the other person, you know? Have you noticed these tendencies? And so in this very simple way, being intimate with the breath, really attentive as the breath is coming in, aware of the breath as it's going out, we can really see how unhelpful that deep habit of needing, thinking that we need, there's somebody that needs to control it, needs to manage it. Do we? Do we really need to? No. And that habit will wear out if it's seen. If it doesn't get seen, it will last forever. And it, just because we don't realize how much stress is involved in that subtle habit of controlling, doesn't mean it isn't stressful. It just means wisdom is unaware. There's not enough wisdom. And we cultivate wisdom. Wisdom arises naturally when there's mindful awareness. Wisdom depends on that reflective knowing to learn something about what's helpful and not helpful. And without mindful awareness, there's none of that learning. So then the, the key will be, as you keep seeing that manifesting, to be on the lookout for any kind of judgment, because you might want to kind of stop controlling the breath, you know, like that parental wag. Why am I controlling? I should be controlling the breath, as opposed to the work there is to be aware that when there's that controlling habit, things get tight like this. So wisdom is always connecting the dots. Oh, there's this unseen or this subtle habit of controlling, and it's making everything tight like this. The more we see that, 
the more the letting go happens. Just like when we're holding a hot pan, we feel the heat, the letting go happens. It's the same thing with these unwholesome habits in our mind. When we see it clearly, the mind drops it. If we're unaware, the mind can continue spinning in that way for a long, long time. So we're almost out of time. I need to say one more thing before we end, which is um, a lot of us, you know, when we come uh, across uh, the Buddhist teachings on mindful awareness, it just makes so much sense. Like, hey, I'm a human being. I have this capacity to be awake. I should probably be awake. It doesn't actually make sense to be unaware and live a life, right? It makes sense. Like if I'm going to be alive, I have a mind and body, I should cultivate awareness. I should really strengthen it. So come next Tuesday, though, you'll have many reasons not to come back to Zoom or come back to the center. And that will be a perfect time to be mindfully aware. Oh, not wanting to turn on my computer screen feels like this. It's just this experience of aversion being known. And when we make peace with that resistance to sticking with it to the end, if you make peace with it, then not coming back won't be based on the not wanting to feel that feeling. We really want to learn that whether it's useful or not to come back isn't based on that feeling. That's just a feeling. It's like when we're lazy, don't want to be bothered, we're comfortable on the couch and the computer's on the other side of the house. Oh, I'll go to week three. I'll skip week two. So just be aware. Okay, what's the mind doing? What's the mind knowing? Oh, it's like this. And then get your computer and come to class. Give yourself six weeks because you want to get enough of a taste to have a sense of this is something you want to continue with. That's all we're going to get with six weeks. We're going to get a taste of what the cultivation of mindful awareness might bring for us in our lives. But you got to put some time in. You got to show up. And I'll record it so if you have family business or work business that you can't make it, usually on Wednesday or the one or two days after the class, I'll send the link for the recording so you can watch it again um, if you missed it or you just want to listen again. So I hope you have a good week of practice. Look forward to seeing everybody next Tuesday evening. Thanks all. Take care of yourselves.